Hello and a great big welcome to C3 Sunderland Online. We're a local church in the heart of the city of Sunderland with a vision for Christ, for people and for our city. My name is Kat and along with my husband Ian, we're the pastors here and we're so glad that you're choosing to join us for church today. Um, if you're new, we'd love to extend an extra special warm welcome to you. It's great to have you with us. And we'd love to encourage you to jump online and fill out one of our Get Connected forms. And this just means we can keep you in the loop of everything that's coming up in the life of our church. And also just so we can reach out to say hello. Let, let, let not this just be an online experience, but the chance to build a community. I also would love to take the opportunity to let you know that on Easter Sunday, the 17th of April, in the evening, as well as our morning service, and we're gonna have a worship and encounter night. And this is gonna be a powerful evening of worship and ministry that will be hosted at C3 Newcastle, our family over in Newcastle at 5 p.m. To find out more, just make sure you fill out that Get Connected form and we'll be in touch with more details. Well, we're in a series right now called The Table, and we've been taking a look at Jesus' life and ministry around the table and what it has to teach us about our discipleship with him. So far, we've looked at the way God extends the invitation to each of us to come and sit at his table. And last week, we explored the transformation that takes place in our lives when Jesus invites himself to our table. And today, uh, we're taking it in a slightly different direction and we're going to dig into this incredible story from Mark 11 where Jesus overturns the tables in the temple courts. Let's read it together from Mark 11 verses 15 to 18. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As, and as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. What a moment, like what on earth is going on in this story here? I don't know if you've ever read this and thought, is this the right Jesus? Is this the same Jesus who says, let the little children come to me? Is this the same Jesus who has healed and helped so many of the most vulnerable people in the world? Is this the same Jesus that invites himself around for dinner to the home of sinners and tax collectors? Well, the answer to all of those questions is yes. And today, rather than skipping over this moment, because it doesn't seem to match up with our modern Western view of Jesus, or rather than misinterpreting it as a license to go out and turn in tables according to our own emotional responses wherever we want, I believe this story has so much to teach us about the character and heart of Christ and what this means for us as his disciples today. And I want to spend the rest of our time together exploring three things that this moment reveals to us about who Jesus is and about how that impacts how we follow him. So firstly, Jesus does get angry about everything that is wrong in the world. You know, in our time and culture, we often have this picture of a kind of meek and mild and passive Jesus. He's like all loving all accepting, compassionate, he's full of mercy and grace. And couple that with our modern culture of tolerance where calling someone's action out as sin is to judge them and to disagree with someone is to hate them. The thought of an angry Jesus doesn't always sit quite right with us. However, what this moment clearly shows us is that Jesus does get angry, but it is not angry like you and I know it. So at the moment, I'm the designated driver for our household. And in general, I am a very good driver. You just need to ask my husband, Ian, and he will confirm. I'm not very prone to road rage, hardly ever get speeding tickets. But I have to confess that last weekend, I might have blemished that record to my regret. It was just one of those weekends where it feels like everyone has forgotten how to drive. 
And I was doing that thing where you pull like into a parking space a little bit to then reverse properly into another one in a supermarket car park. And just as I was about to reverse, someone in a Range Rover, there you go, decided to try and squeeze through the gap that I had momentarily left. And then had the audacity to beep at me when I nearly reversed into them. Well, I've got to confess, I did beep the horn back several times, quite loudly. And on, on general, I'm usually okay with my road rage levels, but last weekend, I've got to confess, I just snapped and it spilled out. But isn't our human experience of anger usually like this? It stems from selfish motivation. Someone hurt us or joked about us. Someone took advantage of us or didn't do what we wanted. When we don't feel in control of a situation or someone cuts us off at the car park, our anger is quick to flare up. It doesn't wait for the full story and it is often disproportionate to the situation at hand. When I've read the story of Jesus turning over the temples in the past, I wondered, gosh, was, was Jesus just having a bad day? Were grace and mercy in short supply that day? Or perhaps he was just so shocked at what the moneylenders were up to, he just lost it, he just snapped. But the thing is, is that our human quick anger is nothing like what is happening in this moment. Indeed, it's nothing like the character of God at all. In Exodus 34, verses six to eight, there's this incredible moment where God shares his name and character with Moses. It says this, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished and he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now there's so much in there, but let's focus on this phrase slow to anger. The original Hebrew for this is erek apayan, which translates as, would you believe it, long nostrils. So funny, but think about what happens when we get angry. We take a quick gulp of breath and our nostrils flare out as we yell. Um, but if you're slow to anger, then what happens? You take a long breath in through your nose. God has long nostrils. He's slow to anger. You see, what's happening in the temple courts is nothing short of complete injustice and misrepresentation of who God is. For the first century Jews, the temple was the meeting place between heaven and earth. It was a holy place. But Jesus finds that the spiritual leaders have become corrupt and are in the pockets of Rome, taking advantage of people who are trying to connect with him. See, they would examine the animals that people would bring to the temple for their sacrifice, but then tell them what they brought wasn't acceptable and offer to sell them a pre-approved animal instead which sounds okay, but it was at an extortionate price. And if you had brought your local currency to buy an animal for sacrifice at the temple, they would insist on you using the temple currency only, but hike up the exchange rate in order to rip you off. You see that they had turned God's desire to meet his people, to have communion with them, to share his presence, into a way for them to become personally rich. And what is Jesus's response? Well, he gets angry. He gets annoyed. He's furious. But the important thing to know in this story is that this wasn't the first time that Jesus had been to the temple. In fact, he's probably been there hundreds of times before. It isn't a spur of the moment reaction, but it is a thought out, measured, on purpose kind of anger that out of love for God and love for people draws a line in the sand on what is not okay. And I feel like this is really important for us as disciples of Jesus to understand because it can sometimes be so easy for us to look at the world around us and think, Lord, where are you here? Don't you care that there are wars happening right now? Don't you care that there are refugees fighting for their lives to find safety? Don't you care about the horrors that child Q suffered in a place where she feels safe? Don't you care about the levels of poverty in our city? Don't you care about the pain that we're experiencing in our lives right now? The answer is 
Jesus is furious, but with this kind of slow anger that is born out of love. He is full of grace and mercy, but I want you to know today he's also not apathetic. And the fact that Jesus gets angry at injustice and pain and everything that misrepresents the heart of God to the world, it should move our hearts with hope and expectation because he cares deeply. Just another thing that this moment should do is it should also challenge us to reflect on the kind of anger that we carry in our own hearts. Are we quick or are we slow to anger? Is this human anger or godly anger? Is this selfish anger or is this anger that is born out of love for God? The second thing that this story shows us is that Jesus will act to put everything right. You see, what we learn is that Jesus won't just stand by while injustice takes place in our world. And that fills me with great hope. After seeing this injustice take place in the temple year after year, visit after visit, being slow to anger, being full of grace and mercy, Jesus does then act to put everything right. And ultimately, this is what we are waiting for in eternity and working for in whatever way we are called to here on earth right now. I love this picture that John paints in Revelation chapter two, verses one to four. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth and for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse four, I love this. It says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What a promise. But it kind of begs the question, well, what do we do in the meantime? I'm sure looking around at our world at large or even on a much more personal level, we can all think of things that are categorically not right. But in all situations, personal, global, social, we are called to reflect the character of Christ. Now I've seen and heard Christians take this moment of Jesus clearing the temple and using it to justify flying off the handle at things. I'm ready to turn some tables over at the office today. I'm ready to turn some tables over in this situation because they said this. But listen to what James, the brother of Jesus, writes in his letter in chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. He carries on in chapter 5 verses 7 to 9. Be patient then brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Do not grumble against one another brothers and sisters or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. You see, we're not to live life passively to the injustice that we see around us or the things that happen to us personally. Absolutely not. The level of love for God and for our world should not allow us to be apathetic. But the more and more as we journey with Jesus, we should be more and more filled with grace, mercy and the ability to be slow to anger, keeping in step with Jesus and how he wants to partner with us in whatever we face. He wants to partner with us in prayer. He wants to partner with us in keeping watch, in our generosity, in our hope, ultimately in standing firm in our faith, confident that Jesus will make all things right. The third and final thing this story shows us is that Jesus will clear a way to the Father. You see, Jesus was clearing the temple because people were misrepresenting the very heart of God to the world by charging these extortionate prices, by doing these dodgy deals, they were making it pretty much impossible for people to come into God's presence. 
But through his actions, Jesus is declaring, come on in. I love in verse 17, he says, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for who? For all nations. There is no one left out of this. And for too long, the religious leaders at the time had been making it harder and harder to come close to God. And Jesus comes in and says, enough is enough. This is not the father's heart. He longs to be close to his creation. I'm making a way. I'm clearing a path. You see, the clearing of the temple here, yeah, it was kind of a momentary thing, I guess. Like I can be fairly sure that once Jesus had stopped guarding the gate, the money changers would have started to sneak back in, started to raise their prices. The people who'd been um, trying to bring merchandise into the temple courts all day would have finally have been able to once Jesus left. But what I want us to lean into today is that this moment here sets in motion the rest of the events of that week. Let's read again in verse 18. It says, The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began to look for a way to kill him. This is the moment that is going to trigger the events of Easter Sunday and Easter and Good Friday. See, a few days later, the religious leaders would bribe one of Jesus' disciples to betray him and hand him over to be tried, mocked, beaten, and hung on the cross, the most painful and humiliating way that humanity has ever invented for someone to lose their life. It's a few days after he clears the temple that Jesus would take his last breath and cry, it is finished. And as he did so, the curtain in the very same temple that represented the separation between God and man would be torn in two from top to bottom in one moment, clearing a way for us to come to the Father once and for all. You see, the clearing of the temple might have lasted a moment, but there is nothing that can stand between God and us. There is nothing that can get in the way. There is nothing that can keep you from him because of what Jesus did on the cross. And as we come to a close today, I want to ask you, I want to make it personal. What is, what is it that's blocking your way to the Father? Is it a wrong perspective about who he is? Is it the thought that he doesn't care or is passively observing the injustice in our world? Is it that you've grown up perhaps with the idea that he's actually quick to anger and you're fearful to approach him? Is it distraction and busyness? Is it the opinion of other people? Is it hurt from people misrepresenting who he is to you in the past? Today, I believe Jesus wants to turn the tables on anything that would hold us back from coming to a deeper and more intimate knowledge of God. I want to close today with a prayer by French theologian Jean Danielou, and he wrote this, I have a need of such clearance as the Saviour reflected in the Temple of Jerusalem, a riddance of clutter of what is secondary that blocks the way to the all-important central emptiness, which is filled with the presence of God alone. You see, as we come to a close today, I believe that Jesus wants to remind every single one of us that ultimately he longs to be close to us. The Father longs to fill our lives. The Father longs to peel back anything that is not of him and welcome us into the fullness of life and freedom with him. And so just as we come to a close today, I'd love to pray for you. And as we pray, I'd just love you to think about Jesus. What is it that you want to turn the tables over in my life? What is it that you want to move out of the way to make more room for you in my heart? So Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to gather today. Father, we thank you that you care so, so deeply about the things that are wrong in our world. God, thank you that you don't just sit on the sidelines, but that you want to partner with us to make things right. Thank you for your promise, your ultimate promise that you will make all things right, that you will wipe away every tear, that all things will become right when you return. 
And as we come to a close today, Father, we just lift up the things in our hearts that we know are not of you. Maybe it is anger. Maybe it is apathy. Whatever it is, Jesus, we lift them up to you and we ask, would you turn the tables over in our lives? Jesus, we long to be holy and set apart for you. Jesus, we long to be a true reflection of who you are to the world around us. And Holy Spirit, right now, I just ask that you would speak to every single heart that as we take this message forward into the week that we would find ourselves walking in partnership with you in a brand new way and Jesus we ask that you would lead us into fullness of life with you in Jesus name everyone said amen well it's been a joy to be gathered with you today I pray that message has challenged you encouraged you given you a lot of food for thought and hey let me say if you're watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, um, but it's something that you'd love to explore or even a decision that you would love to make in this moment right now, today, we'd love to just point you in the direction of our website. You can jump on there and um, there's a little bit about what making the decision to follow Jesus means. There's a prayer to pray. And most importantly, there's a contact form in there that you can fill out just to let us know that you've made that decision. And what that means is number one, we can celebrate the incredible decision that you've made today. Uh, but it also means we can help resource you as you begin this incredible journey of walking with Jesus. We would, it would be our absolute joy and privilege to do just that. Well, we can't wait to see you again next Sunday. Remember, we have our in-person gathering every single week at the Hope Street Exchange where we have uh, the service is a bit fuller than what you see here online. We have the opportunity to worship together, the opportunity to pray for one another, the opportunity to catch up over tea and coffee. Why not think about coming and joining us next week? We also have a fantastic kids program um, that runs every single Sunday alongside the service for all children aged 2 to 10. So it really is for all the family. We would absolutely love to see you there. In the meantime, have a blessed week and we look forward to seeing you soon.